Welcome to Talking Point with Stephen Taylor. It's good to have you along. And today, joined by a lovely, beautiful lady uh, by the name of Judith McGregor, who is the British High Commissioner to South Africa. Hello, Judith. Welcome. <laughs> good to have you here. Thank you very much. So, um, tell me about firstly um, what you use to help you to stay so beautiful, because I want to use the same. You know? <laughs> tell me your diet. I wanna, I'll be starting the same diet very soon. You know. <laughs> well, I can tell you what I had for lunch, which was a fabulous salad from oh, wow. a shop in Long Street in Cape Town. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's something to do with fresh orange juice, which is oh, a great, uh, a great secret. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, vitamin C. There we go. That Lots of helps. vitamin C. There we go. So tell us about Judith McGregor. Of course, uh, you were born in the UK. Yeah. Um, tell us where you grew up, where you went to school, how it all began for you. Okay, I grew up in London, in uh, the suburbs of London, and I went to university at Oxford. And after I was at Oxford, I decided I needed to travel in the world and I took a scholarship to go to Romania. And in Romania, I met people in our embassy in Romania and I talked a little bit about the British Council, about sort of um, embassies overseas and the work that they did. And I there and then decided that I really would like to become a diplomat. And so I applied and uh, the rest is history with various postings in between. So you applied to become a diplomat. It's not yes. a political position, it's a civil no. service position. Explain to us about that in more detail. Well, it's quite a long process. I mean, you know, you have to sort of uh, take exams. I think that's true of most diplomatic services in the world. But we don't t tend to take legal exams or foreign policy exams. You take exams which are problem solving or you have to show wide general knowledge, but also how to manage people, get on with people, yeah. how to <laughs> negotiate with people in a way. Um, and at the time I joined, which was you know, a long time ago now, 1975, wow. um, not many women did apply to join the Foreign Office. Indeed, Was that counted in your favour? Well, no. I think it was counting against me oh, at really? the time. Well, because uh, only a year or so before I applied to join, uh, there had been a rule which said that you couldn't be a diplomat and be married if you were a woman. Uh -huh. So women diplomats could not be married. And uh, so that was a bit of a bar to yeah, people getting on yeah. in the service. Um, but mercifully, by the time I applied, it had gone. But I think it had damped down applications so it was unusual to apply when I did. So were you married at the time that you applied? No, no oh, I wasn't. Okay, all right. So your husband is also in a diplomat, also yes. involved. Um, how did you guys meet? Did you meet as diplomats or how did it work? We did meet as diplomats oh, wow. actually. I met him in the House of Commons <laughs> um, in Parliament at a very late night debate uh, with one of our ministers. He was the minister's private secretary. I was briefing the minister to make the speech and um, and well you know obviously we got to know each other. In fact, I think it was, for me, it was quite a big help having a husband who was a diplomat because at least you could try to align your mobility. Um, I think it's been one of the issues and I mean, one of the jobs I've done or one of the things I've been passionate about is women in the Foreign Office. Yes. So I've been yes. president of the Women's Association for many years, although Tell I've just stepped down. What is that? What is that role? Well, you know, it's one of those things where, yes, people have equal entry to um, the diplomatic service, to the civil service. Nevertheless, when you look at the figures, you notice that many women join the civil service or the foreign service uh, so that in the junior ranks it's like level pegging mm. but as you get more and more senior fewer and fewer women and when you look into that it's of course family reasons um, taking time out to have children difficulties of juggling a mobile career with a family and with a husband or a partner and vice versa of course increasingly these days um, but I think it was also about when there are fewer women, there is less diversity of style. And this is not just true of women, obviously it's true of ethnic minorities, it's true of people with disability as well. Um, so it was a big campaign, it's very exciting to be part of it actually, to try and just loosen it up, you know, basically recognize as you do in business, yes. that actually having a diverse board is hugely important to the profitability of the company and its kind of well-being. Well, so it is in the civil service mm. as well. So I was probably head of the Women's Association for getting on for almost 10 years, actually. Wow. And you still and in charge of that? No, I've stepped down. Oh, okay. I've stepped down. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we really managed to bring on many more senior women, many more ambassadors. And I think just being a role model of somebody who managed to be both a diplomat, um, as it happened, a spouse, and also to have children. You know, all the things that sort of don't always seem so sort of self-evident um, now, what's the big deal? Yes. But 20 years ago were really a big deal for women to achieve. Wasn't Margaret Thatcher around then though? 
Yes, there, but there are always, you know, wonderful sort of, you know, dynamic women who don't necessarily mean that you then get a very strong stream of women in Parliament. Yes. One of the first things I did when I joined the diplomatic service in 76 was to join something then called the 300 group, which meant 300 women in Parliament out of a Parliament of 600, 50-50. Yeah. Well, we still haven't achieved that fully. We're closer to it than we've ever been. Minister, that's, that's a lady. And actually, and yes, I think that's right. What a different environment. Mrs May, who's our Prime Minister, yes. uh, Nicola Sturgeon, who is the First Minister of Scotland, Angela Merkel, who is now the, you know, the, um, oh, I see the Chancellor in Germany. I mean, many, many examples. Uh, and I think a sense of a, a pipeline, if mm. you like, of people who are coming into more senior positions. But it's taken time and it's still difficult. There are societal pressures, there are obviously the need to prioritise and to look after your family. So having paternity leave is a good idea yes, too. Yes. You need structures and then you need role models. And then I think women and minorities themselves also need to be empowered to ask that they be taken into account. Tell us about some of the countries that you've been to as an ambassador and yes. working in the Foreign Office. Tell us about some of the countries that you've worked in. Well, I've worked in some fantastic countries, actually. I mean, I had the great privilege of accompanying my husband to, uh, to Czechoslovakia, when it was Czechoslovakia, um, in 1987, and it's 86 to 89, actually. And that was during the time when the division of Europe into two spheres, the communist sphere and the sort of the free sphere, the wall came down, Europe became one, and I was in Prague for the actual sort of revolutionary gatherings in Wenceslas Square, and that was fantastically exciting at the time. I had the privilege of be working in Paris, which I must say was an absolute um, treat, and organizing the state visit of the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, to France sure. uh, in 1992. But I think actually, I've also had some fantastic postings in my own right. So I was ambassador in Slovakia, which was the Slovakia of the Czechoslovakia because it divided right. after the revolution. Wasn't my cousin there? And your cousin was working also, that's right. Your cousin was my predecessor oh. as ambassador in Bratislava. You took over from him. I took over from okay. him. Okay. And that was fabulous because it was a new country, uh, a newly arrived member of the European Union, uh, a new member of NATO. So everything was new, everything was to wow. be sort of achieved. Um, and I think, you know, Slovakia has been very, very successful. And it's just great to have been there at the beginning of that. And then I was. Um, posted to Mexico as ambassador for four years. And that was a fabulously interesting country. Mm. Uh, emerging power, young democracy, long history, yes. young That's democracy. Hot it's, it's, hot it's, uh, it's rather sort of like in South Africa. Oh, really? It's quite high. Okay. You can have hot bits, but Mexico City is a very temperate climate. The food is hot. The food's hot. <laughs> You're quite right. Many chilies. Yes, yes, absolutely. Do you like chili? Yeah, in moderation, actually. I think that's one of the things I can sort of, you know, take in moderation. So, so Mexico was excellent, uh, and we developed our relationship very well there. And then I came to South Africa, which I must say was a dream, you know, in to come true. In 2013. So when you arrived here, had you been here before? I had been uh, on work-related reasons, but only visiting for a couple of times. And I had never visited, and I'd never lived in Africa before. Wow. So and it was a big, was the, big when change. When you first got that phone call and they said, right, Judith McGregor, you're going to South Africa, how did you feel? And arriving here and being here mm -hmm. and soaking up everything, how has that experience been for you so far? Well, I think very humbling to be selected for it, and very conscious of a very long historical relationship. Mm. Um, complex, uh, rich, um, you know, with lots of challenges and lots of opportunities. So I'm very conscious of the, of the fact that it's a very new country since 1994, 20 years of democracy. And of course, we had the pleasure soon after I arrived. Well, first of all, the grief of obviously yes. the death of yes. uh, former President Mandela, but then the sort of celebrations the following year of 20 years of democracy. Um, many sort of interesting things that have sort of happened. I mean, we had the Commonwealth Games in the UK. UK. We were just talking about yes, sport we before we came on air. And, uh, you know, so sort of working with the South African team to come to that. And then actually the Rugby World Cup the <laughs> following year and take going back with the Springboks <laughs> to the UK. Um, did and you go there? I did because what we worked through was a sort of program to try and promote Anglo South African trade at the same time. Okay. So, for example, we went 
Newcastle. Well, that's a musical Newcastle. Project. Well, <laughs> that's a therein <laughs> lies the rub because uh, the Springboks were playing Scotland, <laughs> yes. and I can tell you that was tricky. But anyway, I uh, I sort of divided my attentions diplomatically. Okay. Um, but you know, using sport as a way of bringing people together, yes. promoting trade and investment, and basically knowledge about the country, tourism. So that was fantastic too. So no, it's been a really uh, interesting period. Well, rugby play did play a big role in our country's history. I mean, if you look at the 1995 Rugby World Cup, Indeed. I mean, that yes. was a turning point for South Africa. And Nelson Mandela put a lot on that. And uh, I mean, if you look at movies like Invictus and yes. stuff like that, yes, I mean, sure. Just it's just hectic to watch how like everything unfolded and how it all worked together and just wow, just amazing. And the changes in I mean, yes. through the film, the, the changes in the perceptions yes. of the team yes. and their ability to work as a team. Yes. I mean, we've got a big program here, well, two programs actually called Premier Skills, and that's run by our British Council in South Africa. Is that sport? Um, it's sport, okay. run with the Premier League, oh, wow. and so the Premier League send over trainers from, in fact, Sunderland is the, is the club of choice, oh, nice. and they work with people in South Africa to train um, referees and trainers from disadvantaged communities all around South Africa and they get to work with Premier Skills trainers and referees and they actually burnish their qualifications. So if you do the work with the Premier Skills trainers, you can get to the first level of being a referee in South Africa. Did you go and to the PPL Live that was here? Did you know that they had that event um, in Cape Town with all the soccer stars and stuff like no, that? No, I didn't go to that. No, no, I, I didn't. Camps, Camps Bay, I think it was. No, you're right, um, actually. I didn't go to the first one, okay. which was in Johannesburg, but oh, I went to the one, one in Camps Bay. Correct, yes, I did, absolutely. Okay. I thought for a minute you were referring to rugby actually because no, no, no. um, yeah, I did yeah. go to rugby as well but no I mean it's such a fantastic program you know the kids get to two things they get first of all to be trained mm. they get sort of proper qualifications and they can actually use them in the context that's kind of equivalent wow. in South Africa and secondly of course they follow it on if they can with have access on websites and on their phones so they get to sort of follow a bigger world of sport mm. and then they really understand how sport is actually something you can do after school it requires discipline if you want to succeed you've got to kind of work at it it's a great program and we're expanding it so I'm nice. delighted yes. we're going to chat more about the projects that you are involved in um, and you being the UK High Commissioner here in South Africa some of the things that you are involved in uh, it is Talking Point with Stephen Taylor we will be back next with the lovely uh, Miss Judith McGregor the High Commissioner to the UK here in South Africa Welcome back to Talking Point with Stephen Taylor. We are in conversation with the lovely and beautiful, I don't know if Aspen's going to like that, but anyway, uh, the High Commissioner to the UK, Ms. Uh, Judith McGregor. Judith, you're still all right? You're still enjoying yourself? Very well, thank you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Time goes quick when you're having fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you were speaking about the projects uh, that you are involved in. Well, you yeah. touched on one, the sport, the soccer. Uh, tell us about an interesting one that I attended the other day, Chevening. Chevening, the Chevening Scholarships. I was like, no, isn't it an evening? But it's Chevening. <laughs> tell us about yes. that. <laughs> well, it's part, as you say, it's scholarships, yeah. uh, postgraduate master's scholarships. And three years ago, we were awarding something like 15 a year. And this year, we've awarded 60 for young South Africans to go to the UK and do masters in an incredible range of subjects. Um, the ones that stood out for me were particularly, obviously, a lot of MBAs, but also water management, um, use of sort of digital techniques in all sorts of amazing kind yeah, of creative, sort of that's yeah. right, management. Um, there was also somebody who was practicing retail fashion management yes. in, in enhancing yes. their skills and so on. So, I mean, fantastic people. And we also got 14 from Lesotho and Swaziland. And if you add on the Commonwealth scholarships, postgraduate scholarships awarded each year by the UK to study in Britain, we sent 100 people to the UK this year on fully paid scholarships. That's amazing. And a quick wow. promo, the uh, application period yeah. for the next round of these scholarships is open right now. Oh, really? So you need to go to www.chevening.co.uk. Uh, or to our website um, at the UK and South Africa, and you can find all the details. So how does one apply? What do they need to do? 
you need to basically have done a first first degree because these are postgraduate scholarships okay. but they're also leadership scholarships so you have to have worked for two years in re with some relevant experience and that's important because the idea is that your training say in water management or in town planning or in fashion you're retail to you're going to use it when yeah. you exactly the idea is you come back yeah. um, <laughs> with your qualification yeah, don't at stay there. Come any back. university in in the UK yeah. and I can tell you you know people aim high I mean they're, they're going to all the premier universities Universities. I heard the names, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, people are ambitious. You know, they're driving themselves. It's fantastic. You come back, and the idea is that you've shown us before you apply, or as you apply, that you're going to really bring this into your schema of work. Mm. So you will bring that skill, that knowledge, that capability back to South Africa. So we benefit from the talent and the enthusiasm and the energy of those amazing young kids that we met, and then they come back afterwards. How long have you been doing this? How long, how long is ah, this? Been? It's been going on for at least for several decades. Really? Yeah, in South Africa wow. since, of course, uh, 1994, okay. and every year we award about 1,500 scholarships. That's insane. So it's so not only do you become. You know, I mean, we hope a friend of Britain, knowledgeable yes. about the UK, yes. but actually, you meet this worldwide group of chiefening scholars who all get together in the UK. So they go there for a year, for a year, and then they come back and then yes. they obviously apply their skills here in South Africa. Yes, and they become part of a, a network of people that we keep up with, and uh, yeah, you know, sort of your reserve bank governor, for example, is a chiefening scholar. Really? Um, yes, yeah, so Seche is a, oh. a chiefening scholar. So you know, it's something where you can both, I don't know help the person to realize their ambitions and at the same time you know do what I think modern diplomacy is all about really which is bringing people together making people to people links and the other big program we're engaged in is the Newton fund which is a, a fund um, a bilateral fund equal completely level pegging between South Africa and the UK where we support research scholarships PhD training, um, research capability enhancing in a whole range of areas. And about 30 million pounds now are invested in this scheme over several years. And it's just, it's just growing all the time because there's such a lot of interest in between research being done in both countries and then pooling it together. So I have to congratulate you because you were knighted by the Queen of England as a dame. Yes. That's major. <laughs> That's big stuff, Judith. How did that happen? How does how does how do you, does the Queen phone you herself and say, Hey, come around for tea? How does it work? <laughs> well you'd be surprised to know that doesn't happen quite like that. <laughs> Um, well, yes, I mean, I had the fantastic honour of being nominated after, obviously, several decades of working as yes. a diplomat um, for my services. Uh, I received a, an, um, an award earlier on as CMG in 2012, and then this year I received the Higher Order, which wow. makes me a dame, which is the knight equivalent. Um, yeah, and I feel pretty good about that. Um, delighted that it happened in South Africa, because I feel that the good work that, yes. you know, we've done, my team have really created with me here in South Africa. We've spoken about two schemes, but there's a range of things, including trade and investment increases. I think that's just fantastic. So I think it's a bit of a tribute to the relationship as well. So, as a, so a dame, you'll go down in history now as somebody that's been knighted by the Queen, right? Well, it was certainly, I'll go down my history. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, obviously, uh, a certain number of awards So you got to meet year. her, she does the whole sword thing, is that how she does it? She does, really? she does. So you have to kneel down on the cushion? Or? Ladies don't kneel, actually, okay. we just sort of bow. Oh, wow. um, gentlemen have to kneel. Okay. Um, <laughs> but no, and it's an opportunity, obviously, to exchange a few words with the, with the Queen. And, so you have uh, a photo with the Queen? And you <laughs> have a photograph, you have indeed a film taken as oh, you wow. do it. Okay. So it's, um, and my family were there. So nice. it was a wonderful family occasion as well. That's amazing. Well done to you. Thank well you. Well done to the great work that you're doing uh, here in South Africa. Tell me about the relationship between South Africa and the UK. I know that South Africa is a Commonwealth country, which means that you're not an ambassador, you're a high commissioner, yes. which is kind of the same thing. Um, you didn't Britain, we were a colony of, of Britain, right? Um, obviously, South Africa is on its own now, independent. How's the relationship between South Africa and the UK? Well, as you say, there's a long history yes. and, uh, and a lot of knowledge in both countries of the other. But actually, I think also um, um, lots of areas that we're actually exploring, if not for the first time, we're really deepening and taking further. So when you were asking about, you know, what are we doing? Well, I was just on my mind at the moment, actually, is that this week, I think, um, in New York at the UN General Assembly, Britain and South Africa are jointly hosting a big meeting on antimicrobial resistance, which you probably know, Stephen, 
often is that yes. sort of worry that we haven't got yes. now the necessary antibiotics to really cope with very serious illnesses. Yes. And obviously TB, for example, which is majorly sort of... That is a big one, yeah. ...around the world, but I know in South Africa yeah. too. So we've been really working together to try and raise awareness, first of all in the G20, but now worldwide. And we have a regional meeting coming up in South Africa in November for the whole of the African region. Because there are things that people can do, mm. money needs to be invested, mm. pharmaceutical companies need to be encouraged to actually really take forward the research. But we need to stop giving quite so many antibiotics to yeah. animals and yeah. to getting them into our food chain. But it's a good area where you may not think, but wow, there's this sort of amazing kind of cooperation going on. I'm also obviously just about to go to the CITES conference in Johannesburg, Sorry. which is all about wildlife protection, environmental protection, uh, international illegal wildlife trading. Yeah. Now that's an area where we've worked very close to with South Africa to try and strengthen the measures that are happening in the national parks to resist poaching. And I'm so delighted. That includes rhinos as well. Well, it includes rhinos, absolutely. Okay. Rhinos, elephants. Um, actually, sometimes it's quite a wide range of sort mm. of animals. And delighted to see that actually the rhino degradations have gone down this year in Kruger, so which is fantastic. Edna Malewa, then? Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. Right. My minister, that's right, Therese Coffey, is coming this week oh, and she'll be having talks with Edna Malewa. So, there are many, many areas actually where we're working really, really closely together. And I suppose the trick of a diplomat is to look for those opportunities yes. to really expand that kind of dialogue. But very shortly, we're going to be reviewing across the board all of our foreign policy. We do that every year. And we've got official talks in London. So there's a lot going on, yes. even despite Brexit. Yes. And uh, gonna you're going to ask me I'm about that. Swear <laughs> Brexit. Yes. Tell me about Brexit. <laughs> Well, I think the main thing to say really is that um, it's yes, fantastic. It is we had the European yeah. Union referendum vote and the government under Mrs May is taking that forward. Um, but the, the big news, I think, really, two big news, if you like. Mm. One is that we are still, of course, very much full, paid up and very active members of the European Union. And that will continue as and until we begin to trigger the sort of the... Article the mechanism, minutes. Article 50, okay. uh, to leave the European <laughs> Union. And secondly, that actually, you know, it doesn't affect really Britain's wish, for example, with the Commonwealth, mm. with the rest of the world, and indeed with our European partners to stay really active and engaged big trading nation, free trade, free traders, uh, mobile, very much into the development of world peace and world security. So it's just always an opportunity for me to say, you know, um, if anything, we're even more committed to that as a result of our European vote. But I understand that the relationship is still going to be there. I heard that there's been meetings been taking place and the European Union is not going to kind of break away from Britain. There's still going to be that relationship because it's important. We, Britain needs the EU and EU needs Britain. So they might be apart, but they're going to be working together, which I like, which is important. It is important. I mean, all countries um, ideally need to be at peace and in a very constructive peace with their neighbours because they have so many common problems yeah, yeah. and they are the easiest partners to trade with. So we will be very fully um, associated with and working closely with the European Union, even as and when we are not technically members of the European Union. But all that has to be negotiated through. Yes. And, uh, and one thing that I'm spending some time talking to people now in South Africa is about you know, the trading of relationships going forward and the very firm commitment to make sure that this new economic partnership agreement, which comes into force in a week or so's time, you know, we very much want to build on that and take forward even better trading arrangements between our two countries in the future. All right. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, tell me, where can people find more information about Chevening and the projects that you are involved in? I think the website you mentioned is just Chevening. Chevening.gov.uk, okay, um, <laughs> but actually just go on to www.gov.uk, which is our government website, okay. and you can find out about everything about the UK. Okay, great. And uh, give John my regards. I Thank still you. have to meet him. I know that he was in Vienna. Did he enjoy yes, it? he was playing his piano. He's <laughs> Does he play piano? Well, he's stopped being an ambassador you? now, but uh, he has serenaded me on the piano, <laughs> but not in the House of Commons. <laughs> right. No, Judah, thank you very much for the great thank work you. that you are doing here in South Africa. And um, you've met the president of South Africa, Jacob I Zuma? have. Yes, I have. I've had that pleasure. Absolutely. Okay. And of course, you work closely with our Minister of International Relations. And yes, uh, very close. 
Judith McGregor, British High Commissioner. Sorry, Dame. I have to get it right, right? There we go. Dame Judith McGregor, uh, British High Commissioner to South Africa. Thank you for your time and thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another episode of Talking Point with Stephen Taylor. Thank you to the lovely uh, Judith McGregor, Dame uh, Judith McGregor, High Commissioner to South Africa for coming on the show. Of course, feel free to get in touch at Stephen Taylor Essay on Facebook and Twitter. And of course, facebook.com forward slash Talking Point. We'll catch you back next week, same time. Thank you to Bjorn, my production team and everybody involved here in making this broadcast possible. Have a good one. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.